crossing the street and struck by a police car. But why does that vehicle just drive away? The footage raising new concerns about the conduct of some officers on the roads. Good evening. The woman involved wasn't hurt. Regardless, she is highly unimpressed. The incident caught on video with police now disputing that series of events. CTV's John Woodward is live with our top story. John. Nathan Rachel Wharton says she was hit by a police car crossing the road. The Toronto police say no, she wasn't. So let's go to the video. See the police car out of the corner of my eye and just kind of braced myself. Watching this video is still unsettling for Rachel Wharton. The Torontonian was walking to work in January when she crossed Dufferin Street. Dash cam video shows a police car turning and then it strikes her, knocking her phone out of her hand and startling her. Scared, a little shocked. Um, and then kind of angry uh, because I, like, as a pedestrian, had the right of way. She says the driver asked her if she was okay. She had some choice words for him, and then he kept driving without giving her any contact information. I realized how lucky I really was because he was going fast around that corner, and he obviously saw me at the last second. She got the video from a driver on the spot and made a complaint with the Toronto police. She said a detective phoned her recently and told her there would be no ticket. The reasoning, she says, was that there was no collision that resulted in an injury. The Toronto police says its officer stopped before a collision occurred with the pedestrian who grabbed the push bars on the front of the vehicle. The incident was investigated and seeing as the contact resulted in no injuries and or damage, this incident did not meet the definition of a collision as defined by the Highway Traffic Act. The incident may have understandably startled the pedestrian for which the officer apologized. However, this was not a collision and the pedestrian was not hit by a police car. Lawyer David Shelnut says that definition may work for insurance purposes, but not for public safety. In this case, there is contact, but now they're saying that it's not a collision. Uh, so it's it really seems like the law is up to the TPS's own interpretation. The TPS didn't respond to questions about the incident from CTV News on Wednesday. Driving safety at the TPS has been in the spotlight after CTV News obtained data on over a thousand automated tickets received by police vehicles. Another turning police car hit a cyclist on Bloor Street earlier this month, causing him serious injury. Wharton says she's worried a recent bump in the police budget could lead to more vehicles on patrol and more crashes. These are the, the police officers that are supposed to protect us and um, just driving very carelessly. She wants some of their new money to go to driver training. So the collision that wasn't a collision isn't likely to go any further. Wharton says she's not going to make any further complaints and she says she knows what happened to her. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Back to you. All right. Thank you, John. Meanwhile, Toronto's police chief is spending time in a North York neighborhood in the wake of back-to-back -back shootings over the weekend. The violence seemingly random. A father killed and a teenager seriously hurt. CTV's Beth McDonnell joins us live with more. Beth. Michelle, there is a lot of sadness in the community after these two shootings. The victims, police say, completely innocent. Arriving in November from Ghana, 40-year-old Adu Boache had just begun his new life in Canada. He was shot and killed simply going about his day walking by a bus stop. Our community is traumatized and very concerned. Boache's Ghanaian community in the GTA is now organizing a vigil Saturday and raising money online to pay for his funeral and support his wife and four children back home, the youngest two years old. He was somebody who really was excited about his, this country he came in. He, he was working and he was excited about, he died very day, he was going to a play, do groceries, and guess the sun, it was a sunny day, you know, and never to come home. Meanwhile, area high school students are sending prayers for the 16-year-old boy shot in the face at another nearby bus stop the day before, with supports being offered at school. We had a meeting with like those like volleyball teams and then um, wrestling teams because he was part of it. And we just talked about how like, you know, like just supporting each other and just being there for each other. Our teacher was like, um, it's okay not to do work today because it was really sad. It was very sad. I'm just imagining that I could have been that person. Some of my friends could have been that person and it's just, it's just terrible. Today's about the community. 
Thank you. All right, here. Toronto's police chief visited the Jane Driftwood community, adding his presence to the neighborhood still on edge in an effort to create safety and listen to concerns. Some community members say seeing the city's top cop makes a difference. There are many issues needing to be addressed. It really is disheartening, but there are a lot of other issues attached to gun violence. There are tentacles attached to this, community issues that are there poverty, racism, marginalization. One of Boache's closest friends in the fundraiser says his death is devastating for his family who are not here to see him for the last time. We can only phantom to a, a wife, a mother, a father being called to be told that your son or your husband or your father who came to Canada, you know, uh, has been shot, um, you know, randomly by somebody. That, to me, is something that is, is heartbreaking. Vigil organizers are asking people to bring flowers and say everyone is welcome to attend. Police are keeping up that very strong presence in the community for the foreseeable future. They are still looking for the suspect in this case, a man between 18 and 25 years old, and they are still looking for information about that black Acura RDX that they released an image of and is on our website. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Back to Michelle and Nathan. All right. Thank you, Beth. Straight ahead, cases of measles popping up all over the world. How long until we potentially see a surge here? The warning from Canadian health officials that every family will want to hear. A former Ontario Power Generation employee has been arrested and charged after allegedly leaking safeguarded information. Police claim he acted with intent to put critical infrastructure at risk. CTV Sean Lee Thong is live with more. Sean. Well, Nathan and Michelle, there is a publication ban in place that prevents us from revealing the information or the evidence that is in place. But if it gives you any indication, the maximum punishment for this crime is life in prison. The RCMP have arrested and charged a former nuclear operator with delivering safeguarded information to a foreign entity or terrorist group. According to court documents, 36-year-old James Musali of Clarington is accused of acting to participate in or contribute to an activity of a terrorist group. Ontario Power Generation, who operates both the Pickering and Darlington nuclear plants, confirmed that a former employee had been charged. A public sector employee search shows that in 2022, James Musali was listed as an employee under the title nuclear operator with an annual salary of just over $102,000. Court documents allege that Musali, between the 30th day of January in the year 2024 and the first day of February in the year 2024, did intentionally and without lawful authority communicate to a foreign entity or terrorist group safeguarded information knowing that or being reckless as to whether the communication would increase the capacity of a foreign entity or terrorist group to harm Canadian interests. According to the RCMP, evidence indicates that the individual acted with intent to put critical infrastructure at risk. With Sally's address is listed to be on a street in the Clarington Bowmanville area, we visited the home today. Hi there. Hello. Uh, I'm Sean from CTV News. I'm sorry, no comment. Neighbors say they saw a man being taken away by police more than a week ago. They had a guy in the car taking him out in handcuffs. There's seven cop, seven undercover cop cars down there. Connie Martin lives down the street and does not know the accused. She says the heavy police presence was startling. It wasn't under like the normal police. They were all undercover. Even the cars were not police cars. Like They were undercover. The arrest was made February 9th, but many on the streets say they noticed a strong police presence for weeks. Because they've always been watching it, constantly cop cards for weeks before that. Multiple police cars just showing up throughout the week. I've just seen a lot of police around like for the last month or so, kind of like, there are lots at a time, like 10 cars. Wasali will next appear in court for a bail hearing on February 27th. So while the RCMP had said that they believe that this crime was committed, they also say they don't believe that there is any risk to public safety. Reporting live, I'm Sean Lethong. Nathan and Michelle, send it back to you. Thank you, Sean. And just ahead, the Toronto Public Library is still recovering from a massive cyber attack last year. A new report saying a lot is still unknown about whose data was compromised. But first, there's a look outside. We did have sun earlier. Clouds rolled in. It's a little bit cooler now if you're outside. 
but mild overall. How will the conditions stick around for the month of February? Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica. It is going to hold on for a little while, Nathan. Really, as we round out the month of February and the kind of final stretch of the official winter season, we're holding on to this above seasonal trend. Some very light showers in and around the GTA right now, the heavier stuff along those eastern shorelines of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. As we head through the rest of our night, we stay quite mild. We're sitting right around 10 through Niagara right now, 7 in Hamilton, 4 in Barry. 5 in Peterborough. We're not really losing any of that heat, relative heat, as we head through the overnight. We're sitting at 5 right now through the island, 7 over at Pearson, and wind still out of the southeast for the most part, uh, especially around the airport. Coming up, a full look at your long-range forecast. Michelle. Thank you, Jess. Anyone who drives in Toronto knows all too well about getting stuck in gridlock. Now, a new staff report says higher penalties for parking on city streets would help deal with the issue. CTV's Natalie Johnson is live with more. Natalie. Well, Nathan, how does $75 for a standard parking ticket sound to you? You might think twice about not paying for parking if you knew that that was the fine that you could be facing. Illegal parking has been trending upward in Toronto and officials at City Hall say making the consequences more expensive is one way to curb the bad behaviour. If you decide to try your luck on a ticket instead of feeding the meter, prepare to soon pay more if you get caught. That's dangerous for me, man. Yeah? I'm downtown all the time. That's not fair because we already are paying a lot. City staff are suggesting hiking the fines for 123 different kinds of parking, standing and stopping offences. In many cases, more than doubling the penalty for bad behaviour on the road. At the end of the day, um, there are people who park illegally here in Toronto in different circumstances and there are major consequences when it comes to moving vehicles, uh, keeping traffic moving, making sure that we have good performance from our transit. Right now, not paying at a parking machine, parking in a permit location without a permit, and parking for longer than three hours could get you a $30 ticket. Under the proposal, that fine would more than double to $75. I just think we need to settle down a little bit around fines and ticketing around parking. The fine for parking in a bike lane would increase 50 bucks to $200. City staff are also suggesting new $75 fines for non-electric vehicles that park in EV charging spots. As for how much money the city could stand to make from the hike, staff estimate the increased fines could generate an additional $62 million a year. But proponents say it's about the congestion, not the cash. People who act legally want to be able to find parking. They're going to have a better chance to do that if illegal behavior is deterred with more realistic fines. Some drivers, though, are decrying the doubling as yet another cost that continues to climb. This is still too much. They should have a little bit less. I don't like it because the city going crazy. Increase the like a property tax and increase no parking. That is crazy. If council likes the hikes, the pricier penalties will take effect August 1st. Now, the city recently increased the rates for some types of parking, but officials say most of the fines have never been increased or even adjusted for inflation. Reporting live, I'm Natalie Johnson. Nathan and Michelle, over to you. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Next to the warning parents will want to take notice of possible outbreaks of measles. The disease starting to reemerge across parts of Europe and the United States, with health experts in this country saying it's only a matter of time before we see something similar here. CTV's Austin Lee reports. Ontario's top doctor is telling public health agencies across the province to brace for possible measles outbreaks. The main concern among infectious disease physicians, vaccine uptake has slowed since the pandemic. But I think people are a little bit tired of hearing of immunizations all the time, but it doesn't reflect the fact that immunizations for a variety of illnesses, measles particularly, are really important. In a statement to CTV News, Ottawa Public Health says the re-emergence of certain vaccine-preventable diseases is being seen in different parts of the world and is a cause for concern. Measles has a very, very effective vaccine, but it does require large proportions of people to be vaccinated to achieve what we call herd immunity. Dr. Wilson says about 95% of people need to be immunized in order to reach that point. But the latest data from OPH shows just 59% of seven-year-olds here in Ottawa are protected against the disease. According to the federal government's website, three people currently have measles in Canada, but it's a different story in the U.S. where at least 13 states are reporting cases. So measles is one of those first harbingers, uh, or the canary in the coal mine, if you will, of diseases of an under-immunized population. 
So that is what we're starting to see. Symptoms include fever, cough, runny nose, and a rash. But in severe cases, it could mean brain swelling or pneumonia, and it could be fatal. The reality is the disease itself can be mild, but it can also have very severe consequences. And so it's dangerous to expose people to a virus that can be unpredictable. The safest thing to do by leaps and bounds is to be vaccinated. Austin Lee, CTV News. Robbing from the public to build the private. That's the key message from a new report shining a light on the state of Ontario's health care system. Advocates directing blame solely at the provincial government. CTV's Raheem Ladani is live outside Brampton Civic Hospital tonight with more. Raheem. Michelle and Nathan, this report from the Ontario Health Coalition is scathing in the sense that it accuses the provincial government of intentionally under-equipping the public system in order to better fund the private for-profit clinics. Calling out the Premier's privatization of health care, the Ontario Health Coalition claims the Ford government is misspending public money. Hundreds of millions of dollars in public money um, is being siphoned out of the public system, used to dismantle and privatize our public health system. In a 16-page report, the OHC outlines how public hospital funding is increasing by half a percent this year, compared to independent health facilities, which are receiving a bump of more than 200 percent. If you're going to say we need to go to the for-profit because our hospitals are not able to handle it, then you have to have the body of evidence that supports that, those decisions. The coalition argues that's contributed to 1,200 closures, including ICU, obstetrics and emergency departments across Ontario. This government has been in power for six years, and for as much as they like to rail on the status quo, the reality is that they are the status quo. And they are failing on every single thing that is important to Ontarians. Based on a year of data, Ontario's Health Coalition says operating rooms in every public hospital are underused, some even being converted into storage due to a lack of funding. Just by increasing the hours at our public operating rooms by a few hours a day, we could get rid of that backlog in about three months. At Brampton Civic Hospital, the situation can be described as critical. The provincial government has come in and announced, yeah, we're going to build you 250 beds. And look, a cancer ward is great, but the reality is based on how fast Brampton is growing with their projected times to open it, the day they open it, Brampton will have a worse hospital bed ratio than the day they announce that with advocates urging the province to push back private and make the public system a priority. The report also looked into the cost private clinics are having on the health care system. It found that a private cataract surgery in Kingston, Ontario, cost the health care system 56% more than if that same surgery was done in a public hospital. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. I'll send it back to you both in studio. Thank you, Raheem. Meanwhile, at Queen's Park, the opposition is presenting a united front. Calling for new legislation cracking down on bad actors among elected municipal officials. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris reports. A show of solidarity from all Ontario's opposition leaders, pushing the government for new rules for municipal elected officials. We should not have to work this hard to ensure that our basic human rights are protected. Advocates say interactions between councillors and staff at school boards and local councils are increasingly tense. Last year, the government shot down a private member's bill aimed at holding bad actors responsible. The legislation inspired by frustration over behavior by a former Ottawa city councillor. He was asking women to come to work without a bra. He was suggesting they go to strip clubs to watch his political opponents. Behavior advocates say is cropping up all over and making communities sick. It is outrageous that in 2024 uh, women are still getting harassed at work with little to no consequence for perpetrators. As it is, bad actors can have their pay docked, some participation limited. But they can actually continue to join the very person they may have harassed while under suspension of pay. When that's allowed and there's no restriction on running again, it sends a poor message to the public and especially women. When bad behavior advocates reason would get most other employees fired is tolerated. Elected representatives are not above the people. They are of 
the people. Women of Ontario say no want the government to pass legislation with protection this session. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing says he's working on something. It is a very important uh, uh, piece of legislation, it has to be constitutional, but has to actually achieve the results that I think uh, uh, that everybody's asking for. Leaving the door open to a new bill before MPPs rise for the summer. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. A six-year member of the Halton Regional Police Service has been charged with improperly handling his official firearm. This follows an alleged incident on January 29th in Burlington. Police say an officer was handling his gun during the course of his duties when it fired by accident. Nobody was injured, but Constable Jordan Lee stands charged with careless use of a firearm. He's been suspended with pay and will appear in court in April. The Trudeau government is announcing millions more in funding to combat auto theft. But it comes not long after a Quebec judge issued a stay of proceedings, letting three alleged members of a luxury car theft ring go free. CTV's Mike LeCouture reports. Flanked by police and other politicians, Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc proudly announced $15 million for law enforcement to crack down on auto theft. But it comes as three men accused of operating a luxury car theft ring in Montreal had their charges stayed because it took too long to get to trial. Obviously a circumstance uh, where somebody cannot be brought to trial in the appropriate timeline and therefore is not a subject to a criminal prosecution is unacceptable. The Court of Quebec judge ruled he had no other choice, blaming the Crown prosecutor for how it took the case three years to get a trial date. The cases must be completed in provincial courts within 18 months, according to the Supreme Court. It means the month-long investigation by Montreal police was all for naught. The police department have the same concern. When we arrest people, we want to make sure that they're going to be uh, going to the court. Now, the Crown lawyer argued part of the reason for the delay was due to a backlog of cases as a result of the pandemic. Tuesday, Quebec's Justice Minister tabled a bill to reduce court delays and to add seven new judges to the depleted provincial ranks. Simon Jolet Barrette says when there is a stay of proceedings, it's a failure of the justice system. The federal public safety minister says governments at all levels continue to look at the judicial system to ensure it doesn't become a barrier to the work being done to crack down on car theft. Mike LeCouteur, CTV News, Ottawa. Protecting children online. The federal government's long-promised legislation will be introduced next week. The Canadian press reports the online harms bill could include an ombudsperson to field concerns about material online. There may also be a regulator to make sure platforms are complying with the laws. The Prime Minister says young people are vulnerable to hatred, violence and bullying online. Experts say Canadian children are less protected than kids in the UK, the European Union and Australia. In Ottawa, House of Commons committee was looking for answers today on why the controversial Arrive Can app was so mismanaged. Why is it a two-person company working out of their basement is allowed to collect $20 million over the course of three years for doing absolutely nothing? If we were talking to professionals from the private sector right now, people would be fired for this. There would be accountability for this gross breach of the public trust. The use of external consultants is also used in the private sector. And I would note, we, I will acknowledge that GC Strategies, the two principles of the company, are, are their business model is to make available IT professionals. Earlier this month, Canada's Auditor General said the government's reliance on sole-sourced external contractors drove up the price of the app, a price which the report found is impossible to determine. Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre is asking the RCMP to expand its investigation. Israel intensified its bombardment of Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip today. About one and a half million people are estimated to be crammed into the city close to the border with Egypt. Residents say over a dozen members of one family were killed in the latest attacks. Israel says Hamas uses civilian buildings as cover, something the group denies. Today, the World Health Organization called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. What type of world do we live in? when health workers are at risk of being bombed 
as they carry out their life-saving work? What type of world do we live in when hospitals must close because there is no more power or medicines to help save patients and they're being targeted by military force? The WHO chief also called for the release of the remaining hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. The king said today he's often left feeling emotional by all the support following his cancer diagnosis. Good evening, Your Majesty. Very nice to see you. And wonderful. The monarch made the comment during his weekly audience with the prime minister. The king told Rishi Sunak he has had so many wonderful messages and cards, and it has reduced him to tears most of the time. Sunak began the meeting by telling the monarch it was wonderful to see him looking so well. The U.S. is offering a reward of up to $15 million for information related to LockPit. Officials are seeking details about the identification and location of the leaders of the cybercrime gang. It was announced yesterday the group has been disrupted following an international law enforcement operation that included Canada. The gang would hold its victims' data for ransom. It hacked Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children about a year ago. Months after a massive privacy breach took the Toronto Public Library by surprise, fixing online services is still overdue. A new report on the cyber attack shows the library remains in the dark about whose information was stolen. CTV's Scott Lightfoot has the details. Four months after a cybersecurity breach that had a major impact on the Toronto Public Library, a final report on that incident suggests it's still not known exactly whose personal information was stolen. The situation is fairly dire. Um, it was an event that was completely unexpected. It caught the organization by surprise. It had a catastrophic impact on everyone involved. A ransomware attack last October exposed the personal information of library staff and their family members. The staff report says the attackers breached a vulnerability in an internet-facing server, exfiltrating and encrypting data from a file service. The library says the stolen information included names, social insurance numbers, dates of birth, home addresses, and copies of government-issued ID documents. At this point, the library is still trying to determine what other information may have been taken, saying, although cardholder, volunteer, and donor data databases were not affected, some data about these groups likely resided on the compromised file server. TPL is currently engaged in an e-discovery process with third-party assistance to determine who is affected and how. The information that was stolen is extremely valuable and we should all be concerned about it, whether or not our data was included. After the attack, the library shut down all internal and external computer systems, including their website, Wi-Fi, and online hold system. Today, some of those services are still in the process of being fully returned to functionality. The report says the library has undertaken significant upgrades to its security systems, and its in-house cybersecurity team will work closely with the city to prepare for any future attacks. Any organization that does not have a mature security plan in place is a sitting duck and may have already been breached if they just haven't found out about it yet. The library says they did not pay any ransom to the hackers, which published reports have said was $10 million. As for what the hack cost, the report doesn't say, revealing only that the cost will be covered by the City of Toronto. As it stands today, there's a lot of questions that remain to be asked about both this report and the future capability of the organization to withstand similar attacks. Scott Lightfoot, CTV News. Coming up when your hockey hero is your friend. The story of how a young boy from Barrie forged a friendship with one of the best players in the NHL. And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert. During the pandemic, the federal government handed out billions of dollars in assistance through the CERB program. Many Canadians have been told to pay that money back. An Etobicoke man was shocked to find out he owes $38,000. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. And another mild night ahead of us. We'll sit at a low of two. We should be around minus seven. So the warmth we built up throughout the day, not going anywhere. The chance of showers is going to linger, but they are very light in nature. And they will wrap up as we head into the day tomorrow. Plus, it only gets warmer as we near the end of the week before a major cool down comes into play. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV.
When the pandemic happened four years ago, the federal government rushed billions of dollars in benefits to Canadians to help them through it. An auditor's report found $4.6 billion was paid to people who didn't deserve it, and the Canada Revenue Agency wants the money back. Here's Pat Foreign and Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan Amichel, an Etobicoke man, says his job shut down during the pandemic. He felt he was eligible for benefits, so he applied for CERB and was accepted. That's why he was shocked to find out he has to pay back more than $38,000. I don't understand why they're clawing it back. I really don't. Terence Bailey of Etobicoke says he was working as an auto consultant when the pandemic happened, which virtually shut down dealerships across the country. He decided to inquire about the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, CERB. I thought, oh, I'm going to apply for it. Why not? Uh, I've paid my taxes over the years and I figured, OK, if it... If it's available to me, then I'll take it. Bailey says he was approved for CERB and received payments each month for a year and a half. I was under the assumption that everything was fine and that it was accepted under good faith. But Bailey was shocked to get a notice from the CRA saying a review found he did not qualify for the benefits and a $38,600 CERB repayment was required. I was just absolutely blown away. I have no idea that this was coming. CRA told CTV News at the time of the pandemic, money needed to be delivered extremely quickly to millions of Canadians, but that the government of Canada made itself clear ineligible individuals would later have to repay amounts they had received. Tax experts say you can appeal your case, but if you have to pay back funds, contact the CRA. They will make payment arrangements over time with you and they will not charge you interest. If you owe money and do nothing, your situation could get worse. CRA can go further and take legal action against you if you don't uh, uh, contact them and uh, make sure that you address the debt. Bailey says he can't afford to pay back the money and fears he may have to declare bankruptcy. I'm on old age pension and Canada pension. I mean, I, I make like $2,000 a month. And how am I supposed to pay back a $38,000 debt, pay my groceries and my rent? And the CRA may hold back any tax refunds, GST credits and other benefits until your CERB funds are repaid. If you do owe money, you may want to seek the help of a tax professional to see if they can reduce the amount owing. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. The OLG says a jackpot winning Lotto Max ticket was sold here in Ontario. The top prize in last night's draw was $70 million. And lottery officials have confirmed that lucky ticket was sold somewhere in the Kawartha Lakes area. They say they'll announce the winner when they come forward to claim the windfall. Someone else in Ontario who bought a ticket online won a million dollars, while one ticket each in Toronto and Ottawa won $100,000. That is some good news. For those of us who haven't won the lottery, I think the good news might be double-digit temperature tomorrow. I feel like a really popular person these days with all these mild winter temperatures, except for the folks who really like the winter kind of activities. Yeah. It has been challenging. A lot of the local rinks, not temperature controlled, but, you know, there's that balance, right? It's easier to get around right now, not dealing with all of the active weather when it comes to snow. There is, though, some rain on the way, so keep that in mind, and we're going to kind of deal with this as we kind of step through the rest of our night and into the start of the day tomorrow. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Lots of sunshine to start the day today. We saw that beautiful sunrise. Uh, Short-lived, though, because the cloud cover rolled in, but temperature-wise, very mild. We're at 11 right now through Windsor, still sitting at 7 here in the city of Toronto. Central Ontario still relatively mild, but the further north you go, say through Thunder Bay, up towards Geraldton, Moosonee, Piawanek, obviously they're a little bit chillier. Tonight, as we make our way through the rest of our evening, we'll be at 2. We should be at minus 7. The same really right across the board. For example, Peterborough, they should be at minus 12. They'll be at plus 1. We're holding on to a lot of this warmth as we kind of step through the overnights and into the day tomorrow. We've seen some very light showers 
off and on already through the early part of our evening. That will linger into the start of the day tomorrow. But temperature wise, very mild. 10. We should be at one really right across the board. Tens, tens, tens. You'll see them. And that's going to continue as we kind of get through our day tomorrow, this warming trend. We've seen a few showers make their way through thanks to a series of lows kind of tracking their way across southern Ontario. The bulk of it will be north and south of us, but we're seeing just a few light showers here and there as we kind of step through the end of our day today and throughout the day tomorrow. Again, very light. The bulk of this is north of us, but we've seen a few light passing showers through the early part of our evening. Getting into Thursday, a little sunshine on the way. Not too bad to get things started. Heading into the afternoon, much of the same. Likely dry for that morning and evening commute. That chance of showers in the morning moves up relatively quickly. We'll see just a little bit of sunshine to start the day as we get in towards our Friday. Relatively comfortable, but we are going to see a drastic drop in temperatures as we head through our Friday night and into our Saturday. So we'll see a kind of a dip in the in the jet stream and we'll see that cold air overtake us. It's short lived, though. So if you're not a fan of the cold, you like this warmer kind of wintry weather you get more of it. Again, 10 for our high tomorrow. We should be around one. That cold snap really takes place as we head in towards our Friday night. So Friday, although still mild, not as warm as our Thursday, but we dip down to minus 14. So any leftover moisture out there likely to freeze. And then as we get into our Saturday and Sunday, we start to warm back up. I want to say seasonal-ish as we get in towards our Saturday through Sunday, some sunshine. And then by Tuesday next week, back up to 10 degrees. Nathan. All right. Thank you, Jess. Also tonight, Beyonce riding high. Her foray into country music is already a chart-topping success as she makes history in more ways than one. Beyonce has conquered many music charts, pop, dance, electronic, gospel, and Latin. And now it's official, the Texas native is also a country queen. CTV's Andrea Case joins us with the details of her coronation. And Andrea, not all musicians are welcomed in that court. No, it's been a long, long history. But by the virtue of the musical style she's released, when Beyonce sings, others listen. Now the country music industry, which hasn't always welcomed black artists, has had no choice but to put out the welcome mat for her. If you say so, I'm gonna have to pack my things and go there have been many before, Ray Charles, Charlie Pride, Darius Rucker, and more recently, Cade Brown and Mickey Guyton, just to name a few. But none have achieved what Beyonce did this week. This ain't Texas. Ain't no hold Beyonce made history with her new country song, Texas Hold'em. She's the first black woman to top the Billboard Country Songs chart with her single, Texas Hold'em, off her upcoming album, and it is number two on the Hot 100. Another single called 16 Carriages landed at the number nine spot on the country charts. The reception was unprecedented for a black artist on the country charts, which isn't always the case. In a perfect world, you get so black, you skinny. Former classical musician Britney Spencer is now a successful country musician. My dad particularly was, uh, was pretty, pretty, not scared, but he's protective. And uh, I remember him specifically saying, like, why don't you go to Atlanta? Like... You know, why don't you go to Atlanta? Like, they might not want you in Tennessee. <laughs> they might not want you down there doing country music. Montreal's Allison Russell is experiencing the highs and lows of the music industry. Two weeks ago, she joined an all-star cast of performers playing the clarinet and singing at the Grammys with Joni Mitchell. And she won Best American Roots Performance. The queer black artist and eight-time Grammy nominee was to be recognized by the house of her adopted home, Tennessee, along with fellow Tennesseans, Paramore. Until she wasn't, the all-white group will still be honored, but she will not. Paramore says it's blatant racism. I think it goes beyond dog whistle. Whether uh, their issue with me is that I'm black or that I'm queer or that I'm an immigrant uh, to the U.S., I don't know. Maybe none of the above, but one can speculate that has something to do with it. This ain't Texas. Ain't no hold em. Beyonce has built a fan base. A week after the song's release, more than 80,000 people had used Texas Hold'em for their TikTok videos. <laughs> no, I will not be doing the dance. While Beyonce is not satisfied just conquering the music charts, yesterday she unveiled her new hair care line. Not a stretch for her. She grew up in her mother Tina Knowles' beauty salon. It's called Sacred. Her mother is the company's vice president, and in case you're wondering, like her music, her hair care line is for all types, all hair, all types of people. Reporting for CW News, I'm Andrea Case-Michelle. You and your beautiful hair, I'll send it back to you. Why, thank you, Andrea. Appreciate it. 
A documentary is on the way telling the story of the Montreal Expos and their departure from Canada. Variety reports Netflix has picked up the film as part of a creative partnership with Montreal film company Attraction. The streaming service says the doc will focus on the setbacks that prompted the team to play its final season in Montreal in 2004 before leaving for Washington. It will also delve into the impacts of that move on the city 20 years later. It's not something we say often these days, but prices have gone down when it comes to airfare. What's fueling the descending cost of plane tickets after the break? Scared, a little shocked, um, and then kind of angry uh, because I, like, as a pedestrian, had the right of way. Updating our top stories, a Toronto woman is expressing her anger after and concern after being struck by a police vehicle downtown. The incident captured on video, but police say it does not meet the definition of a collision under the Highway Traffic Act. Uh, what has happened has shaken our community. Uh, the young man is a ple was a pleasant person. He was somebody who really was excited about his, this country. Toronto's police chief visited the Jane and Driftwood area today following a pair of shootings over the weekend. On Saturday, a 40-year-old man who recently emigrated from Ghana was shot and killed. A vigil in his honour is set for this Saturday. Police are still searching for a suspect. Globally, there's more cases of measles now than there was, for example, this time last year. So we're certainly seeing a global resurgence of measles. Hospitals in Ontario are being warned about potential outbreaks of measles amid a resurgence in the virus worldwide. Ontario's top doctor sent a memo today warning about the disease, saying there are currently four active cases in Canada with two in the GTA. On the market, the Canadian dollar is up a fraction to $74.01 U.S. Oil gaining 87 cents to 77.91 U.S. a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index losing 45 points to 21,172. Stats Canada says there's been a noticeable decline in the cost of plane tickets. The agency says the price of airfare in January was on average 14% lower than a year before. Flight costs also dropped nearly 24% between December and January as demand from the holiday period eased off. Analysts say prices are responding to a mix of increased competition in the airline market and fewer flyers thanks to economic pressures. The price of a ticket was still 10% above pre-pandemic levels. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Just ahead, not everyone gets to meet their hero, let alone be friends with them, but this boy from Barrie has forged quite the friendship with the Leafs' leading scorer, Austin Matthews himself. Their story in moments. They say don't meet your heroes for fear of being disappointed, but that's far from the case for a young Barry boy. Forming a special bond with one of the best hockey players on the ice right now. CTV's Dana Roberts has the story. Oh, another one of Austin Matthew. For Finnegan Spazito, picking his favorite hockey player isn't exactly a challenge. Austin Matthew. Why do you like Austin Matthew so much? <laughs> he scores the most goals. At the age of seven, Finn has already formed a unique bond with one of the best players in the NHL. He's my best buddy ever. And that's me when I'm a baby. That's you when you're a baby? Life hasn't always been easy for Finn. Diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at a very young age, the now second grader goes through two hours of daily therapy to manage the lifelong disease that increases mucus, traps infections, and blocks airways. We're always kind of cautious going to new places. What germs are we going to be exposed to? But it's that very disease that has been center ice of his friendship with his hockey hero. My dad's little brother, who he was extremely close with growing up, had CF, and he's actually the one that kind of introduced me to hockey. After first meeting Matthews just prior to the pandemic, the Spazitos got a call late last year. Number 34 wanted Finn's help designing his skates for the 2024 All-Star Game in Toronto. You like this one? I like that one. I like all of them. But there can only be one. After spending an hour working to get it just right, the design was set, featuring one of Finn's favorite mythological creatures. It's kind of cool, yeah. and it's kind of my thing because I love dragons. But the fun didn't stop there. Finn and the fam were welcomed down to the All-Star Game to see those very skates dig in. Oh, buddy. 
good to see you. Even though there's like 30 other cameras and people around, uh, just seeing him kind of zone in on Finn, and it was like nobody else was there, and it was just the two of them. During his visit to the locker room, Matthews had one final parting gift for young Finnegan, his own pair of his specially designed skates. Wait, I can keep them? Of course you can keep them, they're here, right? With one-of-a-kind memories formed, those skates are now a prized possession for the young hockey fan, proving sometimes it really works out when you meet your heroes. Dana Roberts, CTV News, Barry. Such a great story. Meanwhile, the stage is set for a magical night in the desert. Austin Matthews is back in his home state of Arizona, looking to score his 50th goal of the season. Nice retrieval in front. Matthews scores. It's 49, and the Leafs have the lead. The Leafs centerman had a goal and an assist Monday in St. Louis. Matthews leads the NHL in goals with 49 in 53 games and is on pace to score 75 this season. His team is on a four-game winning streak. Unlike baseball, basketball players don't choose a team to represent if elected to the Hall of Fame. Still, Vince Carter has no question what his choice would be. Toronto. Mm. Toronto. It, 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 I mean, it has to be. That's where it started. That's where it all, you know, to continue the, the rise. Yes, I had great years in Jersey, but it started there. And my confidence and, and, and understanding the player that I, I, I could be in the league was, was trending upwards still in Toronto. The former Raptor is among the finalists being considered for selection to the Hall of Fame on April 6th. That would be nice to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have some something that's nice to see tomorrow? Temperature okay, but then unsettled. A little bit. So we start off on the double digits on the positive side. Really nice. Another 10 degree day as we head into the day tomorrow. But we dip down really cold Friday night. But don't worry, it is short lived and we get right back to where we should be, and then some heading throughout the weekend. Mm -hmm. And a reminder about the new Lotto 649 with two big jackpots to be won on one ticket. Tonight's classic jackpot is $5 million. And the new gold ball jackpot is $50 million. You can head to olg.ca for more information. Thank you, Jess. That's it for us, but be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.